Yeah, so in this video, I'm going to share with you some thoughts I have in regards to the pivot that we've just experienced and kind of where I'm at in that process and uh, what I'm doing to help prepare myself for the fall. So stay tuned. Pivoting was hard and I'm not just saying that facetiously or saying that as a point of, well, no, duh, but it, it was hard. It was hard for a lot, of, a lot of us. It was hard for a lot of people in the system, um, it, those who are teaching and those who are in the educational learning centers across the province. It was, it was a massive switch in a short amount of time and everyone was remarking on how fast everything was able to get online or how fast we were able to determine whether we were going to shut stuff down and give out aggregate marks and, and you know that's all fine and dandy but it, it happened so fast that a lot of us didn't have any sure footing to land on but now that we're seven eight weeks in here we are we have some we have some kind of footing to to stand on because we're some of us are in the middle of a spring term and some of us are looking at the beginning of a summer term in a couple weeks and we still may not feel exactly secure in our spot and I know myself I'm halfway through my spring and summer term and I feel somewhat stable and um, in looking at you know how my students are coping and, and how I'm coping but what is what has really helped me get to this point where I feel somewhat stable and there's three things that I think come to my mind when I look at answering that question and the first one is mindset my my own personal perspective on not just this whole situation but even how I'm going to integrate and adapt and move forward through this difficult time I know for some people it's really hard to look ahead uh, beyond a couple weeks and especially when we're knee deep in it or neck deep in it or eyeball deep in it for that matter Um, it was hard for us to look even a week ahead, sometimes maybe even days ahead. But as we get into it and we adapt and we somewhat become um, used to what we're in, now we're able to sit back and, and take a little bit of a look forward. And, and for some of us, that's hard to do. But for me, I, I have this mindset where uh, I, I want to adapt quickly and I, and I always want to keep one eye on the horizon to make sure that I don't lose sight of where I'm going in all of this immediacy and this urgency. The second thing that, that comes to mind that helped me really wrap my head around this change and, and get my whole mind, heart, attitude, action involved in it was quite frankly, my colleagues, both at where I'm working now in my secondment and in my institution, watching them in the midst of all this gave me a lot of courage and gave me a lot of strength and actually showed me that one, I'm not alone, but two, that I, I don't have to do this alone and that there are lots of people around who can help. And indeed there were, and I won't, I won't lie to you, there were some times where I did feel alone and I did feel isolated. Uh, but they were few and far between and there there was one week in a, in, a, in a post I did a couple weeks ago that it was a really tough week for me and that was really the first week that it had hit me so hard that way and I know that there were some outside influences uh, affecting that but for the most part watching my colleagues through all of this really gave me a lot of encouragement and really gave me a lot of fuel to keep moving forward. And the third thing that comes to mind that helped me in this transition is the idea of remembering my stewardship and that I have a responsibility to look out for my students, to look out for uh, my colleagues and, and not just you know in, in a way that I'm their protector per se, uh, but I'm, I'm here to help and I'm here to be of help Sometimes that's just a listening ear. Sometimes that's just sitting and allowing them to download everything that's in their brain so that they can begin to grab onto some kind of sanity through it all. But really the third thing that's helped me through all of this is being, being mindful of the stewardship that is given to me, and especially in this role called educator facilitator, I take that role very seriously 
and I want to make sure that I'm doing my best, even though this is a crazy time, I want to make sure I'm doing my best to provide them with the best opportunity to move forward. Okay, so we've caught our breath and we have our feet on some solid ground now and we're looking at uh, surviving uh, and maybe even thriving a little bit in this next phase of what we're involved in. And so the question now becomes now what? Or maybe the question is more along the lines of, okay, so what now? And I think there's a certain rhythm that a lot of us have found ourselves getting used to now. And, and it's, it's, I won't say it's to the beat of a drum, but there's, there's a certain rhythm and a pattern that we get uh, wrapped up in as we move through this uh, time together. And so that rhythm and pattern begin to give us some sense of normalcy in a very unnormal situation and a very unnormal time that we're in. So again, I, I look at the question and, and the question is, so what helps me? What, what has helped me achieve this rhythm or this cadence, this, this pacing that I find myself in? And the first one is my students um, and, and those that I have the privilege of facilitating learning with. And a lot of them are taking two or three, four courses at the same time that they're working. Some of them have lost their jobs. Some of them have experienced downturn in the amount of work that they're doing. But for the most case, most of my students in, in my classes, and I'm teaching three night classes right now, they're all taking multiple courses and they're still all working. And some of them have family. And so their lives are just as busy as mine, if not busier. And watching them adjust to this time that we're in is actually giving me some real courage and giving me the opportunity to to really catch my breath and and keep the cadence moving uh, not just for my own sake but also for theirs again I would also add to this piece something similar that I added to the last question and and, th and that's my colleagues and I'm, I'm gaining a lot of energy and a lot of inspiration um, and and quite frankly uh, a lot of insight to what they're doing and how they're doing it, how they're coping, how they're helping others. And it's a real testimony to me. And I, I really appreciate it. And, and I don't know if they know this or not, but it, it, it's affected me deeply, not just watching them and how I do my own job in, in my day job, but also how I interact with my students and night school. and. Uh, some of these people I'm watching from afar through, you know, social media, uh, and quite frankly, some of them I'm watching from afar just because we have social distancing, and we're connecting virtually. Um, I guess if I had the opportunity to say anything to them, I I just I just say a big thank you, and 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 keep keep doing what you're doing because it's inspirational, not just to me, but inspirational to the students that, that I have the opportunity to, to teach and to be with because I know that what I'm giving to them is really an overflow of what my colleagues are giving to me. And thirdly, to answer the question, what now, uh, I, I look to my mentors and I begin interacting with them and asking them questions about what should I do now and what should I be looking out for now. and, and what, what's there, what are some blind spots that I may have moving into this next phase of um, going back to whatever normal looks like? And they, they've been really gracious to me in the sense of not telling me what to do, but asking me deeper questions to help me understand what I want to do and more importantly, why I want to do it. And that's been really helpful. And so in this second stage of catching my breath and getting some cadence and getting a pace and asking that question, okay, so what now? I'm finding my mentors and asking me that very question, okay, so what now? All right, so looking at stage three now, I'm kind of forcing myself to deal with the question, okay, so I'm looking ahead to the fall, what's next? What's coming up for me next? What do I have to do? What do I have to get done to be prepared? And I'm, I'm working through the scenario in my head uh, where somebody comes up to me and says that very same thing. And so they would ask me, so Tim, 
what do we need to do? Well, how do we need to prepare for the fall? And I guess if I was to boil it down to one thing and just have one answer for them and even an answer for myself, I would look at the answer being something to the effect of now is the opportunity. Now we have a real chance to make a change in what we do moving forward. Now is the opportunity for us to make some real significant changes. And I know in the last seven, eight weeks, we've been forced to make changes to a degree that we never thought were even possible. And quite frankly, did we even think we were ready for them? And and I know that it's been a, a huge burden on all of us. And like I said earlier, I'm really thankful and, I, and I'm really inspired by what I'm seeing around me and my students and especially my colleagues. But if I was to boil it down to one answer, it would be now is the time for us to really start planning into our fall what we want to do. How do we, how do we want to engage our students? How do we want to build our next syllabus with some care put into it, with some real deep intentionality, not just for them, but for us? And so I guess if I was to boil it down to one answer, it would be that. And so how am I embracing this opportunity? How am I going to answer that question? How am I going to, more importantly, live out that answer? And so here's, here's three things that I'm thinking about that I want to share with you now. First one is I'm really serious about upping my teaching game. Uh, and I'm not just talking about my face-to-face -face interactions, obviously, but I'm looking at upping my game as an educator and a facilitator in the online world. So I am, I'm buying some books and I am doing what I can to read specific chapters. I am listening to podcasts. I am talking to colleagues. I'm talking to people who have been doing this longer than I have. And quite frankly, I'm, I'm just admitting to them, I'm not that good at this yet. I wanna get good at it. I wanna be better at it. But right now, quite frankly, in some parts of it, I suck. And, and I need them to help me figure out what I can do to make my game even better. So I'm looking to uplift my game uh, with regards to how I teach and, and where I teach for that matter. The second thing is, is something that, that's hit me out of a book that I've read, and I'm telling everybody about this book. Um, it's called Radical Hope by Kevin Gannon, and I'll put a link to it down in the, in the description so that you can take a look at it. Um, but it's, it's a fascinating book written from a guy who has got tattoos all over his body, who was not that great academically when he was growing up, and even was a, well, he calls himself a late bloomer academically when he was in college. He almost flunked out, dropped out at, uh, in his third year of, of his undergrad. He wrote this fantastic book, and if you haven't read it yet, you need to read it. You need to get it. It. Um, and so, like I said, I'll leave some some information for you in the in the description below. Um, and and so, pick up the book and and read it. My favorite chapter out of that whole book was chapter eight, and it's called "Pedagogy is not a weapon." We don't use our syllabus, we don't use our course calendar, we don't use our course descriptions as blunt instruments to beat our 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 students into submission. Rather, we turn it around and we begin, we begin to engage our students with even the building of a course calendar. And I know that's radical for a lot of us, especially those of us in trades and vocational education where we have third-party certification exams, we have outlines that are dictated to us and how and what we need to teach. But I really believe that when we begin engaging students in the process of learning, they actually learn better, they learn more, that it sticks with them longer. And, and, I, and I'm in this camp with him that I, I have to have this radical hope if there's any hope of educational change coming out of this crisis that we're in. The third thing that, that I'm thinking about in regards to how am I embracing this opportunity is that it all begins with outcomes. Uh, a good friend of mine, Dr. Sally Vinden, uh, would, would hearken onto this day in, day out, morning, afternoon, evening, night, doesn't matter when you'd ask her. She would always say, it always begins with the outcomes. You start at your outcomes and work backwards. And there's this other great book that I'm reading right now called Small Teaching Online and by Flower Darby. And, and I'll, again, I'll leave the description for you in, in, in the notes below. But, but she says, start with these outcomes 
and reverse engineer a backwards design uh, your way into the beginning of the course. And it's a fantastic way to look at building what I want to build and building what I, I want my students to experience. But I just get passionate about this because it really begins to open the door for me to be not only creative, but to be intentional, to be systematic, to, to, be, in, to be really in depth with what I want to do. And it really begins with asking the question of myself and, and of the content and of the syllabus, why? Why are we doing this activity? Why am I giving my students this particular assignment? And if I begin with the end in mind and work my way back, I'm confident that any course that I'll have in the fall and moving forward is going to be 10 times better than what I'm doing now. And, and some of you who are watching this, you're already doing that. And you are the example to me. And as you move forward, you lift me to move forward. And it's, it's fantastic. And I, and I just I can't say thank you enough. So those are the three things that have really been percolating in my brain about how I'm embracing this opportunity and, and lifting up my teaching game and, and understanding that pedagogy is not a blunt instrument that I bring into the classroom. And it all starts with the outcomes. It all starts with what do I want them to walk out with at the end of the course? and then work my way back from that. So I hope this was helpful for you. I know it was pretty helpful for me just to even get it out and uh, to get it recorded and to put it out there into the big wild universe that we call YouTube. Thank you for taking the time to watch. I'm so thankful that uh, you have uh, stuck it out this whole video and, and, and I'm quite honored that, that you have chosen to even watch this uh, to begin with. Thank you. Uh, if, it's, if it's brought any value to you, would you please hit the like button? Uh, and would you consider subscribing and hit that bell because uh, whenever I load up a new a new video, uh, you'll get notification that it's there. And uh, again, just thank you for watching. Thank you for doing what you're doing. And thank you for the inspiration that you're providing for a lot of other people, including me. All right. Take care. Be safe.